Hello, everybody. Can everybody hear me all right? It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I want to thank the Stephen Alexandra Cohen Foundation, uh, the Icon Mount Sinai School of Medicine, and uh, Joel Dudley and the folks from the Institute for Next Generation Healthcare for having me here. Um, late Late October, uh, sorry, late, late of 2016, uh, one of my patients came to me, and he, he's a gentleman who um, had well-documented chronic and neurologic Lyme disease. He had been around the block a few times before he came to me. He had gotten a couple of courses of IV, and he would get better, and then he would relapse. And under my care, we designed a regimen that uh, pretty much kept him well with uh, what I call industrial strength amoxicillin minocycline and malarone because he also had uh, babesiosis. And he's one of those patients that uh, many of you probably are like him. They're always scanning the horizon for the next best kind of treatment. Um, and uh, he had been following the work of Kim Lewis for a while. He probably knew about Kim Lewis maybe uh, not quite as long as I had been aware of Kim's work. And uh, because of that, he probably ferreted out that uh, there was this YouTube video of Kim Lewis giving the keynote speaker address at the first annual Mount Sinai School of Medicine Lyme in the Ear of Precision Medicine back in October of 16. At the time, I wasn't even, for some reason, I wasn't even aware of that symposium. But he found this, uh, this video on YouTube. And uh, this, is a, this is a photograph of mine of, of Kim at the, one of the LDA conferences in Philadelphia, not the, not the Mount Sinai one. But, uh, during that keynote speech, towards the end of the keynote speech, um, Kim um, mentioned that in the test tube, um, disulfiram was more or less, you know, sort of the best, most potent agent that had been identified, bar none. And he, he referenced uh, the foundational work of uh, Jayakumar Rajadas and Ravi Potaneni, um, who published their study with high throughput uh, testing in vitro uh, and, and identified disulfiram as very, very highly active. This is uh, Dr. Potaneni. He was the lead author on that. And Dr. Rajadas, who's going to be speaking shortly. Um, and if, in case you're not familiar with it, this is the, this is the drug, uh, disulfiram, which has a very, very complex pharmacokinetics. And, uh, so my patient saw this, uh, and, and he, he, he approached me, and he's a very respectful patient, very trustworthy, and he says to me, hey, doc, can I try this stuff? So first of all, um, I thought about it. Here's an FDA-approved drug. Um, it's got a long track record. It's been in use for 60, 70 years uh, for the treatment of alcoholism. And uh, at that point, you know how much I knew about disulfiram? Zero because I never had occasion to use it. So I did a little bit of research on it and uh, familiarized myself a little bit about it and kind of figured out what's the toxicities from it, what's the dosages. And, uh, but be before I agreed to, uh, to, to let him use it, I, I want to ask, I want to pose this question, like, why would I grant his request? You know, why would I grant his request? And uh, I don't have time to go into this in detail. And that's the other thing I've asked, uh, I've asked the folks from uh, LimeMind to post all of these slides because I'm not going to have time to go over them in detail. So this is going to be, uh, I, I should have said at the beginning, th this is my mission impossible, which I've chosen to accept, which is to tell you all about disulfiram and the treatment of Lyme and babesiosis in less than 15 minutes. <laughs> but um, some of the things I say and a lot of the things I don't have time to say are on my slides and I, I would, um, refer you to look at those afterwards, because I'm not going to be able to cover everything. Um, so why would I consider granting his request? So one of my famous patients, uh, Vicki Logan, um, was a patient who had, it's a long story, I don't have time to go into it, but she um, turned out that she was treated uh, in a way that was supposed to cure Lyme disease, and then it turns out uh, later on the Lyme organism was grown from her cerebrospinal fluid at the Centers for Disease Control in Fort Collins, Colorado. This is the, um, this is the abstract that was submitted at the Fifth International Congress uh, on Lyme Borreliosis in, uh, in Arlington, Virginia. 
And you'll notice that the co-authors include folks from CDC. And the conclusion was uh, culture of this cerebrospinal fluid specimen of, of BSK2, that's a culture media, yielded a strain of B. burgdorferi. Culture confirmed treatment failures have been previously reported for three Lyme neuroborreliosis cases in Europe. The present case apparently is the first of this type to be reported from the United States. So this made the front page of the Science Times and New York Times in, 19, in August of 1993. And this is me at, at Vicki's bedside in Northern Westchester Hospital Center. And this also uh, resulted in a guest commentary in the Journal of Clinical Microbiology. I love this quotation from Charcot of the Salpetrier. Disease is very old and nothing about it has changed. It is we who change as we learn to recognize what was formerly imperceptible. And this was from that paper. This is back in the early 90s. Chronic persisting infection not yielding to antibiotic treatment presents a dilemma for the patient, the physician, and for insurance companies that are contractually obliged, or should be, to pay for medically necessary treatment. The solution is not the denial of the reality of patient illness or imposition of arbitrary restrictions on allowable durations of treatment, but the design of more effective and less costly treatments that can keep patients well. Aside from the prevention of the illness in the first place, methods achieving sure cure for those already infected must be developed. Antibiotics may not be the answer. Rather, application of new techniques of molecular biology to interfere irreversibly with key metabolic or reproductive processes of the bacterium wherever it may be found in the body, including intracellular sites, may provide more effected, effective and targeted therapy. So I was ready. I was ready for better treatments or, or other options. Um, the Logan case and several other cases were, were um, printed in uh, my article on chronic Lyme in the spectrum of, of uh, antibiotic responsive chronic meningoencephalomyelitides. And by the way, um, this article is now available online. If you go to the, the Desulfiram article that is published under MDPI Antibiotics, there are supplementary links where you can access this article in depth. And it, it discusses the Logan case. Um, I don't have time to go into this, but she ended up developing a, a pleuropericarditis after she was out at the Mayo Clinic for implantation of a, uh, a baclofen pump, which didn't really work out. But while she was out there, the rheumatologist there, because she did have some markers of autoimmunity, decided that she might have lupus and put her on big slugs of steroids and then shipped her back to me. And she had developed this, uh, this huge um, pleuropericardial effu effusion. So this is her mediastinum and it's mostly fluid. The heart is right in the center. And with that kind of condition, um, you often have to um, create a uh, what's called a pericardial window to let, allow the fluid to escape so the person doesn't develop tamponade. But anyway, I don't, this is her pericardium. And this is a, a touch prep of her pericardium by Paul DeRay, uh, who was at the NIH, um, showing a, a beautiful Borrelia compatible structure. This is after she had gotten even more antibiotics. So in other words, proof that we're not curing the infection with our available antibiotics. I'm going to rush through this. This is another patient of mine who had a grapefruit size rash in his thigh. Um, his wife um, brought them to the doctor. The doctor didn't have any idea what it wrote. This was in the, in the mid 80s. And, uh, and he tested negative for Lyme disease. So uh, the wife kept telling to people, could he have Lyme? And they said, no, because he was seronegative. Um, it's a long, long story. It's all reported in that article, which I encourage you to, to see. He, he developed massive hydrocephalus, and he had a florid meningoencephalitis and cerebellitis. And his tissues um, were sent to, um, to Dagmar Herlinska at the Borrelia Reference Laboratory of the Czech Republic, who on electron microscopy um, identified structures that she felt were Borrelia, and also with primers from Ben Luft at Stony Brook, she, sorry, she was able to uh, detect the signal for uh, B. burgdorferi. So what I'm getting at, these are my own patients studied in depth, proving persistent infection despite very intensive antibiotic therapy. So that's why I was, I was open, open to trying something different. Um, that just sort of repeats the same thing, that we need better methods of treatment.
Okay, so let me get back to this patient. So, so anyway, I, I agreed to let this patient uh, be treated, and uh, whenever he had gone off antimicrobial agents, he deteriorated within a couple of weeks. I said, you know, if we're going to do this, I want you to stop all of your other medications, because otherwise I wouldn't know what disulfiram did or didn't do. I prescribed disulfiram for him, and I, I kind of picked a number out of a hat just based on what the usual doses were for treating, uh, treating alcoholism. I sort of picked the upper end of the, the standard dose, which is 500 milligrams a day, and I said, I want you to, he lived at some distance, so I said, send me a note every couple of weeks, let me know how you're doing, I want you to have labs every couple of weeks, and he did all of that, his labs were fine. And uh, then a couple of months later, he leaves a message on my office voicemail, canceling his follow-up appointment and declaring, I'm cured. And, he's, and he happened to mention in passing that he had required a hospitalization, but he didn't tell me why. So naturally, I'm curious, right? So I call him back up, and uh, he tells me that he's feeling well, he's off all of his medication. And I said, well, what did you need hospitalization for? And then he mentioned to me that he had required a psychiatric hospitalization. And, uh, and then I did a little bit more in-depth reading about disulfiram. It turns out disulfiram can affect neurotransmitters, and there have been some reports of of neuropsychiatric illness, even frank psychosis related to the drug. So I called him back, and I discussed it with him, and I pointed it out to him, and he, and he says to me, eh, Doc, uh, I, I don't think it was the disulfiram, because he was under a lot of situational stress at the time. But then he says to me, but even if it was, it was worth it. <laughs> and don't fail to offer that to other patients just because of that. He was like practically admonishing me over the telephone. Anyway. He's now 27 months out on nothing, more than 27 months feeling well, and we've been in touch with him on a regular basis. So, I mean, that just kind of knocked my socks off. I mean, I've been in this field for 30 years. We've never seen anything like this. After that experience, uh, I shared it with a couple of other patients, and uh, again, I don't have time to go into it. If It's all outlined in, in excruciating detail in my article, but patient two, patient three, similar experience, and th these were very tough cases. And I said, after the third patient, you know, I said, I gotta report this experience. So that led me to reporting this case, uh, these cases and, and this experience with disulfiram. So, um, so that's the article, it's open access, and again, there are supplementals so that you can link to other information. Um, okay, so, I don't have time to go into all of this. There's going to be slides. Uh, let me just say that the, the optimal use, the optimal regimens for the use of this drug are not completely defined and remain to be defined. This agent, in my experience, is extremely potent. And although I started the first three patients just arbitrarily on, on a fairly hefty dose, which, by the way, I wouldn't recommend for most people, and nowadays, we're starting at very, very tiny doses, uh, like 125 milligrams every third day only, and slowly ratcheting it up. And that way, it's much more tolerable. And uh, what I've been finding, some of the patients that I started on this drug were very, very precarious uh, in their condition. And we started them on tiny doses, and, and finding that even 125 milligrams every fourth day, one of my patients is a 260-pound gentleman, very, was very, very ill. And these patients started making incredible progress. So I don't know whether that kind of low dose will enable you to achieve a, quote, enduring remission or not, but it's very therapeutic. Um, there's a lot of stuff that I'm going to have to skip over just because of time. I've only got a couple of minutes left, right? Um, so uh, this is... I don't want to call this a guideline, heaven forbid, it's just my protocol. There was a time when Khan's current therapy would describe the method of, of, of prominent physicians in their field, and that was quite fine before the year of guidelines. So let's just call it the method that I'm using, and it's subject to change, okay? And, and this is going to be available um, um, on the LimeMind site. Um, and there's some patients... Uh, who have needed to be retreated, and we're still figuring this out. It's, and another thing to say, we don't even really know at this point what the mechanisms are by which this drug has its effect. And it's a very complex drug and has a very complex pharmacokinetics. Um, I'm just going to skip to this. Uh, unfortunately, I have to confess, I, I do not know how to do Excel. So, Dawn, my. <laughs> 
Dawn, Dawn, my office nurse, and I just put this little graph together. And uh, this, is, this is our, I, people want to know this, so I want to get this out. This is our summary of the first 30 patients um, on disulfiram. And probably 85% of the patients endorsed deriving benefit from application of this treatment. Um, and then we see those little E's in that column toward, toward the middle. Those are the patients who are enjoying what I'm calling enduring remission, meaning they've been able to be off all treatment for at least six months, remaining well. Uh, a lot of the other patients I haven't followed long enough to know that they're going to be enjoying that enduring remission. But I also want to indicate that we've had some significant adverse re reactions to this drug. So this is, this is a tricky drug that really requires care, titration, and the patients really need to be followed carefully. Some of the patients have developed peripheral neuropathy, which s seems to be different than, you know, the, the Lyme neuropathy, although it's been pointed out uh, it's sometimes difficult to distinguish um, peripheral neuropathy from Lyme. Anyway, and, and we've had a few patients who've had some emotional upset, nothing serious, but you have to really follow the patients carefully. And also, one, one important thing is to know when to quit with this agent. I just want to, there's a lot of unanswered questions. Um, also, what the, what's the mechanism? Uh, I just want to bring this up to you. Um, Vicki Logan uh, ended up um, passing away, um, and if you want to know the details of that, it's, you can find that in my book or my 42-page letter to my then Congressman Chris Gibson, which explains what happened to her. But um, her tissues have been studied, and in fact, Eva Shapi just published with colleagues a detailed study of her tissues and her tissues are rife with biofilm. Every cut of every tissue, brain, heart, liver, kidney, and not just small amounts of biofilm, large biofilm aggregates up to 300 microns laced with Borrelia. If you know anything about biofilm, it has a structure, there's a metabolism, oxygen is going, going in and carbon dioxide is going out. One of my speculations about one of the reasons why disulfiram might be um, more effective than our standard antibiotics, one of the breakdown products of disulfiram is carbon disulfide. So just to remember the periodic tables, guys, remember that? Di sulfur is directly below oxygen. So what I'm getting at is carbon dioxide is a small molecule, very diffusible. Carbon disulfide is a very small molecule, very diffusible. It's known that carbon disulfide has antibacterial properties. So my pet theory, but I really don't know, and it really deserves for the study, is one of the reasons that disulfiram may be effective is that, that this breakdown product, carbon disulfide, may be able to diffuse widely, including in uh, biofilm. Anyway, thank you all for your attention. I think I'm, is my time up? Thank you so much.